Let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter number 37. Genesis chapter number 37. As we begin this new series that we've entitled Tried by Fire, and we're actually using some verses from the life of Job as kind of a theme for this study of the life of Joseph. Joseph, or, or Job, excuse me, said, man, I'm going through a hard time. Things are difficult. God, I'm looking for you. I look forward, I look backward, I look to the right, I look to the left, and God, I can't even perceive that you're here. But no matter if we can perceive him, he always knows right where we are. And Job said, for he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And that's exactly what we see in the life of Joseph. Joseph faced many difficulties. Faced many problems, circumstances that were beyond his control. And at any point, Joseph could have used any of these things as an excuse for why he could not walk with God, why he could not serve God, why he could not do what was right, and why he could treat people in the wrong manner. But we never find him doing that. Despite all the difficulties and all the hardships, he continues to love God. He continues to have faith that, as we heard this morning, that God is faithful and true. And that no matter where he was, whether he was at home or a million miles from home, God was right there with him. And maybe you're here this morning and you're facing some difficulty. It may be one of the things we're going to touch on over this series. It may be something completely different. And you'd say, man, I'm just going through a hard time. I want each of us to try to look at our difficulties from God's point of view. We often look at our hard times through selfish eyes. I know that I do. I mean, we have this woe is me type mentality. I'm facing this difficulty and this hardship, this problem, this amount of stress and weight is pressed upon me. And we see it kind of as overwhelming. But we have to remember the God that we serve, that he is with us, that he does have a plan and he has a purpose. And here we're going to spend some time looking in the life of Joseph this morning, and we're going to look at tried in the home. In Genesis chapter number 37, we'll, we'll begin with just reading verses 1 through 4 and kind of continue on from there. Genesis 37, verse 1, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. When his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We are thankful that you are a God who is so faithful and true. You are the God who keeps his promises. And Lord, even though we face difficulties in this life, we face many hardships. And there may be some this morning that are completely overwhelmed by the circumstances that they are in. Lord, they have problems in their home and they've got difficulties, financial problems, health situations that they're facing God, I pray that you'd help each of us to look at these things from your point of view. That you do have a plan and you have a purpose. You're trying to make something good and beautiful out of our lives. I pray that you might strengthen and encourage us through the life of Joseph over the next few weeks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> and so... I want us to look at a couple of things here out of Genesis chapter number 37. And uh, we'll kind of divide it up just a little bit here. But the first thing I want us to look at is Joseph's coat. Joseph's coat. Now, it tells us that Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And uh, these are his generations. And he says, Joseph being 17 years old. Now, remember Joseph was uh, the son from uh, the, the wife that, 
Jacob really loved. They had, they had a difficult, this was not uh, a, probably the most traditional of homes. It was a home like a lot of homes today, uh, kind of broken and, and melted together. And uh, there were stepbrothers and stepsisters and stepparents and You've got uh, a couple of wives, a couple of concubines, and most of the time when you have these type of uh, families today, everybody's at least split up a little bit. But here you've got this whole big conglomerate of families and relationships, and boy, just so complicated. And it wasn't what we think of as the traditional family where there's a a father and a mother, and, and they're all their kids. It was, it was a total blend of children and parents together. And it uh, looks a lot like a lot of homes and families today, where we've got stepchildren and stepparents, and we've got foster parents, and we've got adopted parents. And what a blessing it is to be able to uh, share love and, and, and uh, to help someone who's not necessarily our biological family. But here... It's not what we would think of as some picture-perfect family. And it tells us about Joseph here. And uh, Joseph was from from Rachel. He was from the beautiful bride, the one that Jacob really wanted. And, of course, he was tricked and deceived and marrying the uglier sister and and just a whole funny, complicated story there. And uh, we'll, we'll kind of leave that alone and let you dig that and chase that rabbit trail for yourself. But because Rachel couldn't have kids and Leah could, there's this, you know, fighting and squabbling and bickering and worried about uh, their kids being favored and getting everything and this wife being favored above this wife. You know. And so she said, here, take my handmaid and have children with her. And, and so not to be outdone, Leah says, well, take my handmaid too and have children with her. And so you've got this really complicated, messy home. And the first thing we need to understand is that there are no perfect families out there. If you're looking for the perfect family, we often look at people from a distance. We see kind of on the outside, and man, it looks like this family just just has it all together. And their kids are so well-behaved and so respectful. And man, I'm lucky if I can get my kids to do anything without throwing a fit and this and that and embarrassing me in public. And we kind of look at it that way. There are no perfect families. Uh, I think of a, a family right now that, man, from the outside, my wife and I had a lot of conversations about a certain family many, many states away from here. We, and, and this was kind of before we had kids and everything else. And, man, their, their kids are so respectful and just seems like everything's all together. Man, the Lord really showed me there, there is no perfect families. And that family broke up, and there's so much bickering and fighting and hatred and all kinds of just stuff. And uh, that, was a, that was a pastor's home and a pastor's family. And sometimes we look at people. I don't know that many people would look at my family and say, that's the perfect family right there. I mean, you've been around us long enough. You've seen my kids have meltdowns and everything else, and me have a meltdown. And every once in a great while, my wife will have a meltdown. <laughs> many of you do not believe that, but it is true. There's no perfect families. Joseph home wasn't perfect. And so if we want to make excuses and say, well, if I just had these people for my parents, sometimes we do that as teenagers, don't we? But man, if it just my parents were like these parents, my friends' parents, man, they're so awesome and they're cool and they're fun and whatever else. And No, there's no perfect family. There's hardships, there's difficulties, and and. Joseph's family was was absolutely no different. So when you think about the life of Jacob and his family situation, and here you've got Joseph, it tells us, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now, one of the things as you study the life of Joseph here, Joseph was placed in an overseer position over his brothers. This is not like Joseph is tattletaling. I've heard that, that said before. You know, jo- they, they kind of get down on Joseph. He's a tattletale and this and that. No, Joseph was put in a place of authority over his brothers. He's fulfilling his responsibilities and uh, bringing back the report of what his brothers are doing. 
And, uh, but it tells us that Israel loved Joseph, and here's where part of the problem lies. More than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. So here we have uh, favoritism in the home. And Jacob should have known the trouble that this causes. I mean, you remember what happened with Jacob and Esau? Man, Isaac loved Esau because he went out, he was a hunter, and brought back the venison and all those types of things. Maybe he could relate a little bit more to Esau, so he favored Esau. And you remember Jacob was favored by, by his mother. And just the trouble and the dissension and the problems that were caused there. And of course, Jacob had to run for his life because all the, the deception that took place from the favoritism. And uh, so Jacob should have known. But he continued on with what happened in his home. And listen, we can either make excuses for who we are, or we can correct it. We can look back at our child, and there's a lot of people, man, the people that I talk to and counsel, that they want to blame their parents, and they want to blame the home life and the family situation where they're in. And you can do that all you want. You can play the martyr, but things are never going to get better. That's not going to solve any of your problems by blaming your mom or your dad or whatever on who you are today and why things are the way they are. You can either make excuses or you can do an evaluation and say, you know what, man, Isaac and, and Rebecca, they showed favoritism. And look at all the trouble that it cost. Man, I don't want to continue that process, so I'm going to do things differently. And that's what we have to do is we've got to evaluate and say, listen, this is not the way that it should have been. Yes, there were difficulties, there were hardships, there were real things that happened. But I'm not going to use that as an excuse. I'm going to change the situation for my family. And I'm going to move forward and say, you know what, this is not the way that a father ought to act. And so I, as a father, I'm going to change and do something different. We might be able to look back and say, as a mother, this was not exactly the way that it ought to have been. I wasn't treated in the right manner or this or that or whatever else and say, I'm going to change the way that I choose to mother and the way that I choose to parent. But he continues on. Jacob continued the cycle here. And it tells us that he loved Joseph more than all his children. And he made him this coat of many colors. And uh, there's a lot that has been told about this coat of many colors. One of the things, as you study out the word for coat here, uh, it's actually a word that refers to the palms of the hands and the sole of the feet. This was a very long, flowing coat that was given to him. And uh, the point behind that is that he was going to be in a, a position of authority. He was not going to be a laborer. Because if he was going to labor, he'd get down and do whatever, and his coat would get all messed up, and he'd trip over it and everything else. This was a coat of an overseer. And so by handing his, this coat out and giving this coat to Joseph, it was very evident. It wasn't just the fact that he got him this, this bright colored jacket. It's what the jacket represented, that he was going to be in authority and an overseer of his brethren, and that was not going to change. You could probably throw in some things about the inheritance at this point. And his brothers would be able to see and recognize that. That here we have our younger brother who is being put in a position over us. And kids pick up on favoritism when it's not even there. And I think of all the times that my brothers and my sister accused me of being the favorite. They weren't necessarily wrong. <laughs> I'm still the favorite to this day. But even when it's not there, it's picked up on. Never mind when it is. And uh, all the dissension and the problems that it causes. And you notice in verse number 4, And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Now maybe your home life is like this. His brothers absolutely hated Joseph. They never one time woke up in the morning and said, good morning, Joseph, how are you today? 
they could not speak peaceably unto him. Proverbs tells us that life and death are in the power of the tongue. We need to be so careful about the words that we say, about the things that come out of our mouth. Man, the things that I hear some parents, even in joking, say to and about their children and just the damage that that can do emotionally and all those types of things. We need to be so careful, even in jest, about the things that we say. They could not speak peaceably unto him. Now, Joseph is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus knew what it was like to have a difficult home life. I mean, all throughout his life, he was made a mockery of. Psalm 69 paints a wonderful picture of the home life of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that him and his mother were the song of the drunkard. Verse number uh, 8 Uh, In Psalm 69 tells us, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. He was basically a foreigner, an outcast in his own home. Of course, we're reminded of Hebrews that tells us that we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. You may be here this morning in your home life has been a train wreck. And there's been abuse. And there's been neglect. There's been hurt and there's been hardship. And I want you to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ knows exactly what you feel like. He knows exactly what it is that you're going through. I know a lot of homes, there is no peace and there is no harmony. In a lot of homes, it, it is a place where there is much fear. That's not the way that it should be, but unfortunately, many people find themselves in those circumstances. If you're here today and you have peace and harmony in your home, it may not be everything that you want it to be. Children, your parents may not be exactly what you would want them to be. But if you've got a roof over your head, you have peace and harmony, and you do not have to fear for your physical, emotional, sexual well-being. You ought to get on your face and thank God every day. But that may not be the case for you. First of all, if you are in a circumstance where you are not safe, emotionally, physically, or sexually, you're being abused, I would encourage you to get out of that situation as fast as you can. I want you to come to me or come to my wife, and we will help get you out of that situation because God is not asking anyone to stay in those circumstances. You do not have to stay in that situation. But the Lord knows exactly what it's like to have a difficult home life. Joseph knew what it was like to have a home life. His brothers absolutely could not speak peaceably unto him. There was bickering. There was hatred. There was fighting. There was arguing. There was favoritism. And so Joseph's home life was terrible. I want you to see, secondly here, Joseph's dreams. Joseph's dreams in verses 5 through 11. Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it to his brethren and they hated him yet the more. How much worse could it get? They already could not speak peaceably unto him, but now things are going to escalate. And uh, you notice he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. So he tells them about the dream that he has, and and the meaning is well understood. They knew exactly what it meant. You can see from their response, Are we really going to bow down and and pay obeisance to you and, and serve you? Now, this dream may be a foreshadowing of how that was going to happen. Um through the drought and all those different things, and we'll get there eventually in our study here. But they hated him yet the more. Notice verse 9, and he dreamed yet another dream. 
and told it his brother and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Now, his second dream is going to help us out understand some things in the book of Revelation. We won't take time to go into that this morning, but you can kind of dig into that for yourself. Uh, But you notice that his father does rebuke him, but he also takes some time to observe it. It reminds me of Mary that... She pondered all these things in her heart. And Joseph's really thinking about and mulling over what's being done here. But once again, the the visions and the dreams that are given to him relate exactly what's going on in his life already. He's been put in a place of leadership and authority. But his brothers hate him yet the more. So things are, are escalating, and they're escalating very quickly. And finally, we see Joseph's pit. Joseph's fit, pit. Verse 12 says, And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. Now, if we're just kind of reading through this, that doesn't mean a whole lot to us. But Shechem is the place uh, where they got revenge on the, the, the rape of Dinah and uh, killed the men of the city. So uh, they would not be well liked in that area. But it was a place where there was a lot of water and uh, food for the cattle and the sheep and all those types of things. And so it was a place where they went. And uh, Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So basically Jacob says, Listen, didn't your brother take the, the sheep to Shechem? Now, this is going to be, uh, even years later on his deathbed, Jacob gets after his sons for what they did here in Shechem. Just brutal and cruel, he talked to them. You're bloody men. So he was worried that the people of Shechem were going to rise up and gather together and basically wipe him and his family out. So going to Shechem is probably something he didn't want to hear that they were doing. Just go and check and make sure everything's okay. Make sure nothing's going to happen to them while they're there. So that's exactly... Oh, what he does. They're not actually there in Shechem. As you read, they've made their way to Dothan. So this is uh, probably around a 65-mile trip total to get to Dothan, about 50 to Shechem and another 15 on from there. But Joseph follows after him and and goes to, to give the report. Look at verse 18. When they saw him, now remember, things are escalating. They went from hating him and not being able to speak peaceably. They hear the dreams. They hate him yet the more. Now they see him afar off. Even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. They're going to be able to tell a long ways away, Joseph's coming. He's got on his coat, and here he comes. Notice verse 19, they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dream." They're going to make sure that his dreams do not come true. They see him coming. Let's kill him. Things have escalated. Remember the story of Cain and Abel. Boy, how hatred can rise up very quickly. And in anger, we can do a lot of things that maybe we wish we hadn't done. But they hate him and they decide, hey, we're going to kill him. Now, Reuben has a little bit of common sense to him. He hates his brothers, but I think he's not maybe as much worried about his brethren as he's worried about himself. Being the oldest here, he heard it and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him in verse 21. Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness and and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. And so they take the coat of, of many colors off him. They cast him into a pit Now, later on, we see that Joseph kept his brothers in prison for three days, and so possibly here, Joseph himself was in the pit three days and three nights, just as the Lord Jesus Christ was. Remember, he is a type of Christ. But uh, they decide they're going to throw him in this pit, and uh, Reuben's, he's going to save him. He's going to come back later on and, and make sure he gets home safely. But while he's out and about and doing whatever else, 
And his brothers look up and they, they see a caravan coming. And they decide, hey, wait a minute. There's, there's no profit if we just kill him. Why don't we sell him into slavery? There's been a, more than one brother and sister that has had that thought in their time in their life, I'm sure. I know I'm not the only one. Things have not changed. I'm, I know my brother thought about that more than once. You know, since I was the favorite too, he wanted to get rid of me as well and figured his chances of being the favorite were a lot better, but he still had Jonathan and Mickey to get through, so he's, he's way down on the end of the line. <laughs> but hey, let's, let's profit off of him. Let's sell him into slavery. And that's exactly what they do. And uh, we find that they sell him into the hand of uh, Potiphar, Pharaoh's house, captain of the guard, the thing tells us. And they decide they take Joseph's coat, they're going to rip it up and dip it in blood and take it back to Jacob. Jacob, you know, this, do you know if this is Joseph's coat or not? They kind of weave this elaborate story and... Uh, a lot of kids have been there weaving elaborate stories about certain things that they have uh, tried to do. I've told more than my fair share of those stories that we came up with to tell our parents. But, uh, boy, the, the trouble in their home and the difficulties. But one of the things you're going to find with Joseph is Joseph never uses it as an excuse. He never points to his family and says, because my brothers hated me and because of the kind of the mixed family situation, and it wasn't ideal, and I was mistreated, and nobody ever spoke kindly to me. Nobody ever came and, and played with me, and whatever else, I can behave a certain way. And I can't live for God, and I can't serve God, and I can't amount to anything. And so often we use everything as an excuse today for why we cannot do what's right, and why we cannot serve the Lord. The Lord's not looking for excuses. He's looking for us to be available so that he can use us. Joseph knew like Job did. When he's tried me, I'm going to come forth as gold. Later on at the end of the chapter, Joseph says, listen, brothers, not the end of the chapter, but the end of his life. He says, listen, brothers, you meant it for evil. You hated me. You didn't like me. You mistreated me. You sold me into slavery. You meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. See, Joseph knew even in the most difficult times, God was working. And God was moving. And he had a plan and he had a purpose for what was going on. I don't understand the home life that you're in. I don't understand the exact reason why God may have allowed you to be in the circumstances that you're in and what you've gone through. But I do know that God is faithful and true, as we've heard this morning, that he does have a plan and a purpose. And I know that in my home life, I'm able to say that when he's tried me, I'm going to come forth as gold. That because I've gone through certain circumstances and certain things in my life, the Lord has brought me to this place so that I can use that for his honor and his glory. It may be the most horrible and worst thing that you can possibly imagine to happen in your life. God can and will use that to help you and to help others if we stop making excuses if we stop using it as a reason for why we cannot, and instead we say, you know what, I may not understand specifically why, but I know who is in charge, and I know who is in control, and that he is going to use this to do something in my life and through my life. Tried in the home, when he has tried you, you will come forth as gold.